So Manidhi, what we are going to try to do today is build the, the front end of an app like Instagram, which has a newsfeed. Uh, like we know, you can actually scroll down and the newsfeed never ends. You keep seeing either uh, all the people you follow or you actually start seeing uh, recommended posts after a certain period of time, maybe advertisements, uh, whatever be the case, you never want this uh, newsfeed to end or when you want it to end when you have like 10,000 posts, let's say. So this is what we want to design. Um, how would we go about doing this? So uh, first let's start with something simple. Uh, I guess the recent changes to Instagram will make it slightly more complex. Let's go to the slightly older version, which is just a reverse chronological order of all the posts of all the people you follow, right? Uh, I mean, technically it almost never ends, but uh, yeah, I mean, it ends at some point, but in real in reality, it's too long. Uh, so I think it will capture all of the necessary things uh, that we want to uh, for uh, like a very long feed for designing a long feed. Yeah, yeah, you have like, let's say 1000 posts or, or people who follow a lot of things, we have to build it for everybody. So you're absolutely yeah. right. It's really long. How do you actually show this on the mobile is something I don't understand, honestly. Uh, yeah. From the from the backend side, if you ask me this question, right? What I'm going to start thinking about is, okay, I'll build a paginated API. Okay, I'll keep some things cached uh, and, and stuff like that. But uh, is it also the same on the mobile engineering side? Uh, and and like, how's it different? Uh, how do you, how do you guys think? Because I start thinking in terms of, okay, I'm going to break it into services. I'm going to make a database for each one of them. You know, if something goes down, yeah, the Indian one is working while the U S one is not working. Uh, is there, uh, is there a similarity in, in mobile engineering for that? Yes. Uh, I think, um, most, uh, backend folks will definitely gravitate towards the scale aspect of it. How, uh, will you scale to so many users? Uh, uh, how will it be my APS be fast? Uh, how will it uh, be able to return the right data? And, and uh, on the front end side, it typically uh, one device only takes care about one user's data. So there is this automatic uh, delusion that, okay, things became a lot more simple. It did, right? With one user, things actually became a lot simpler. But what brings complexity is the life cycle of uh, the apps. Uh, for backend, you just you get a request, you serve the request, and that's uh, that's the end of the life cycle. Maybe you have some of the entities in your system which live outside the life life cycle, like your maybe your uh, in memory caches, all that stuff. But on the uh, on the front end. You have a life cycle for literally every entity in the UI. Every page uh, has a life cycle. It's in the focus. It's now gone. Like you might have to get rid of a lot of in memory cache. You're showing a lot of images which are very heavy, right? So you might need to keep them in memory for fast access, but you can't keep too many of them. So while the user is scrolling really fast, you need to be really uh, thinking about, okay, how do I prefetch some of those heavy resources so that users is, user is not just looking at gray boxes, right? Yeah. 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 I think response time is something that we have, but uh, it's not like, you know, you have to respond right now. Like it's okay. <laughs> you know, the SLA, yeah, you have, you have like, uh, you, you need to respond quickly, but it's like 200 milliseconds or something. And, and we never think in terms of image loading time and all that, that's CD and that's you guys yes. Yes. on the, on the mobile side. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and like the aspects uh, apart from the life cycle aspects, we, uh, one of the things that bring, brings challenge is the constraint uh, for a mobile device. Uh, on the server side, we typically uh, have a, uh, in our control that okay, uh, we get to choose the size of the machine, we get to choose the type, uh, the runtime, uh, runtime. I guess. Uh, we just have Android and iOS in the mobile front, but uh, but you get challenges as to okay, what kind of uh, device is this? This is a high resolution device, so you will have to load high resolution images in that. So you need to adapt to the device that you are running in, whereas you choosing where you are running in, right? Uh, yeah, that and you'll have to respect the kind of. Uh, 
free space the user has left in his device. You can't just allocate uh, GBs uh, for your image cache. Uh, you have to be slightly more forgiving about, okay, I should have less amount of cache for myself, or you can size your cache based on the free space left uh, in the uh, in the user uh, user's device. And you can, you probably also have to interact with the system's APIs, which are telling you, boss, we are running out of storage. You might have to do something. We are running out of RAM. So you might need to reduce the in-memory stuff that your process is taking up. So uh, while a single device on the client side is looking at one user's data, uh, the complexity in the amount of data uh, actually reduces, but the size of those individual data, like the images, videos, reels, right? how much do you keep in the cache, all that stuff, and the life cycle of each entity, the application as a whole, each page, each individual view, uh, we'll get into the view life cycle slightly, why it is important for a feed kind of a thing. Uh, but yeah, these all bring in the complexities. Now, complexities aside, I think we can jump into, okay, we have to build a feed. Uh, uh, yeah, what kind of APIs do we want? Right, right. Manideep, I, I actually want to reiterate what you just said. Uh, and like, I want to understand if that makes sense. Uh, okay. You have limited resources limited memory, limited processing power, you have a, a kind of a god above you which tells you that, hey, you're, you're, you're going beyond your limit, you're doing, uh, let's say, you know, I, I'm, I have limited memory, uh, maybe you can't open so many files together. Uh, so the things you can do is kind of limited. It's also, you have multiple devices, like you said, uh, that yes, the code base is, let's say, on, on Android or on uh, iOS, but different devices may behave differently. So, and like you said, high resolution is, for example, one component. Maybe certain devices uh, will stop video after five minutes. Maybe some devices will not stop video after five minutes. Uh, is that also, is that also some part? I, I'm, what I'm understanding is the complexity is a little more. <laughs> yes, to, the as to when it comes a lot more which bring in the complexity for just the correctness aspect of it. Just to be able to live uh, and work uh, on the uh, work as an app, it becomes more complex because of too many vectors and you don't control when they happen, right? Uh, on the server side, you do get into race conditions uh, 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 and stuff, but mostly they are with resources which are outside the request scope, you have full control. I mean, uh, but in, in the app side, your, uh, it's a constant uh, aspect of how you're thinking about this. Any class you're writing, you need to be thinking about, okay, is this uh, only going to be accessed from the main thread, which is the UI thread, right? Uh, or is this going to be accessed from anywhere? Is there state in here, right? So we, with the recent, uh, I would say, advent of high memory devices and, uh, uh, like the complexities involved with uh, synchronization, multi-threading, we, we prefer, I mean, we ruthlessly prefer immutable objects and immutable representations because we can just throw them around in any thread, start a asynchronous process with that, them as the input and not, not worry about some process changing the state of that object. And uh, affecting uh, my UI or my application state and the correctness uh, as angle of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you guys should go to in Scala. Leave Java <laughs> go for Scala now. Uh, there was a uh, there's a small anecdote here uh, that uh, one of our trainers uh, he was at Morgan Stanley teaching and he was saying that people moved to Scala and they realized that they solved a lot of bugs that they didn't even know. Uh, in terms of concurrency and uh, I think some developer time he was talking about, you know, one fifth in terms of concurrency issues, but it's extreme cases. Uh, maybe, maybe front end engineering faces this every day on back end. I feel like immutable objects. It takes a lot of memory also. Like you keep creating for any new thing. You don't have updates. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. Okay. 
So Manidip, like I was saying, uh, the the expertise at drawing diagrams is very useful. Uh, I can say that here's a server, here's a database. A database has its own icon, which is, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, basic idea that I would say, I mean, if if someone is asking for any kind of API, uh, which is too big to given a single response, I'll say, okay, fine. I'm going to paginate this API. Uh, you know, maybe internally I'm going to save on resources by not sending uh, all the, the entire response together. I'll send some of the response and then some of the response uh, on the, on the gateway, let's say, uh, again, this is a distributed service. I'm going to make sure that the request which comes in here uh, is authenticated and everything. And finally, there's going to be a client over here. So in our case, it's a mobile client. Uh, now, mobile client says, get me newsfeed. I say, okay, how much newsfeed do you want? You want for the last month? Okay, um, I'm going to go and pick that up from the DB. So I'm going to have an index on, let's say, time. Uh, and then I, I'll say, you know, an index on time is not good enough. What money deep is following, you know, specific people, three or four people. So I can't go and search the entire uh, database for that index of time. So I'm going to, let's say shard users according to their, uh, according to who is following them. Okay. So I have a copy of the database, which is according to who is following whom, uh, and I shard on that basis. Uh, and then I, I basically see their updates, their posts over here. Uh, I make a timeline over here roughly, uh, and I come back and give a response. This is at a very, very high level. Of course, this is even now terrible, but uh, at, a, at, a, at a very high level, uh, you know, somehow magically you will be getting uh, a response which has uh, an array of feed basically. Yeah. Yep. So at this point is where I say, I don't know anything. The problem with uh, the, let's say backend engineering is that I don't know who's actually going to access my API from this gateway. It could be that uh, there is a third party app which wants to scrape Instagram. It could be that, uh, you know, our own internal people want to actually use the system. So maybe there's a dashboard that you have to make. So I don't know who's accessing my API. I just know that I have to give this kind of response and keep it very yeah. generic. So at this point, uh, could you help us out? Like what, what actually happens uh, in this? So let's uh, go from the other side, right? Like let's go to directly to the user. What do we want the user to be able to do in the UI? The UI has a list of feed items, right? You open the app, we load at, we load the feed items and show it, right? Now, most apps allow you to do it. Pull to refresh, you should be able to get new items. Right? I'm looking. The other functionality is user is scrolling, scrolling. He doesn't even realize that all this magic is happening underneath, but we automatically figure out that he is about to read the, reach the end of the content that we have already fetched. And we try to fetch more from the server, right? Uh, so we should we have the ability to get the next set of items to what the user is seeing. It is important uh, while we are designing the actual API uh, and how uh, we de uh, define the parameters of the pagination, but the user should be getting the next set of items for what he is initially saw. Right? Similarly, it continues uh, on and on, and the clients also have to have a limiting condition here in, in a lot of cases, right? Like it's like the edge case. How does the client know that the infinite scroll actually has ended? Right? What is the limiting condition? We'll figure out like when we are defining the actual JSON structure and the URL parameters, we'll figure out, okay, how can the uh, client know that items have ended, right? Okay. And okay. Uh, so Right. I am seeing you're taking a requirement based approach. Is it you're, you're actually looking at what is needed. Yeah. The UI demands a certain way of, um, at least approaching the problem in my, I mean, I always kind of start from the user front, the requirements front, what all will we need? For example, uh, when we, most uh, apps allow you to do it in iOS, you touch at the top of 
the screen and you will be able to scroll to top right and which will dictate that you should always have that starting page uh in the app right how no matter how long you scroll right that i mean maybe this did, didn't dictate an api at this point but it, it dictated the way we are storing the items on the client just because he is now 100 pages deep even though you have forgotten some of the pages above you can't forget the first one if you allow the user to go to the top of the scroll with just one tap right yeah, yeah. and i think some apps also have that arrow thing on the yeah. on the right top just button click on that and boom yeah yeah back to that's the kind of uh, things that will kind of dictate it will dictate what all you will need it will tell you okay it will surface uh, okay these are the edge conditions and stuff so okay okay uh, yeah this is this is uh, much much it's more it's user centric yeah clear, yes uh, i i guess i think it's strange that no one ever i mean at least me personally on the on the back end side i don't go like oh look at that the user is behaving this way i'm more like what does the user need <laughs> they need this kind of data okay i'll keep that kind of data okay you're asking me to you know uh, give him this kind of data fine i understand you are going to i i think more in terms of the number of times you're going to hit this api i will bring in performance based on how many times you want to hit it not so much in terms of what are you doing specifically because i i go like you know you are doing something uh the the other person might be doing something i'm just building a api on top and you use it but uh, <laughs> i don't know do you think it makes sense for uh engineers to know the end to end of the system so that they they understand that okay fine maybe i should go ahead and cache this part of the thing like like you said you know refresh scroll to refresh the top page is always there should that be cached <laughs> specifically because you're doing that on the ui anyway Uh, yeah so that that happens on the ui uh, luckily kind of uh, so but it is good to uh, have like a reasonable black box kind of structure it's like your breadcrumbs to the user at the finally right at least you know the path in which things are uh, traveling in so when you actually encounter that okay i'm not particularly understanding how things are working in this flow then you know okay which black box to open you know that's how at least i also uh uh my mental model also works in terms of the back end right sometimes i need to know that okay what this api call is doing this post call is doing is just writing something in a uh, putting something in a kafka queue and it is actually reflect going to take some time before my it, it is reflected somewhere else in the other get api or something right so yeah do you do you, i mean <laughs> uh, i'm i'm interested in asking this is it like uh, you treat everything behind this gateway or uh, you know any api that you're hitting a little like a database like if you know the internals it's awesome but uh, uh, if you know it's important to know the internals but you treat it like a black box like yeah if i i send a request i am going to get a response it's important to know the semantics of how the data is traveling and how Uh, and what are the uh, implications elsewhere right so for example this uh, you can take a simple watch list kind of api right just either you add an item to the watch list or you don't right you can do uh, you can do it two ways the add basically takes some time uh, that uh, getting updated in the back end because if i mean hotstar watch list is not something so uh, Uh, like concurrently used but likes or something like that. whether it takes time yeah asynchronous versus synchronous those kind of things right and uh, that will basically allow, allow you to understand okay the cache that i have in my database that some of those items might actually be fresher than the what the server is re- returning me in this api so i always need to be mindful of the time stamps or those kind of comparative parameters so to understand okay do i override my item with this what the server is returning right now right those kind of things okay amazing that that that's how i uh, like 
I approach it and the pagination will get to. I think right now when we, I am in actually. Uh, and uh, how do I just uh, start writing JSON structures or something? So okay. you can take text from here, yeah. uh, let's say, and then you, you know, you can pass in JSON. Uh, let's say an object here. Oh, this is also good. Yeah. Okay. okay. What you're doing is also cool. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it has linter, but you can type in JSON. Uh, any text is fine. Yeah. I think the JSON as JSON is, uh, like the lesser important uh, part of this, but uh, let's, let's try and understand, uh, what, how would we do the pagination? Like how would the API parameters look? Feed and maybe you have most folks do pagination with an offset and a size. Right? This is what most of us do, which works for a lot of cases, right? But to hook on to uh, the, like, what will be the next URL for, okay, now I got the first items, right? We'll say, uh, is P a shortcut? Okay, fine. This is the first page, right? And, So let's say, uh, let's say you have that page right here. Okay. Right. And then, then <clears throat> if you end up with the same URL, uh, or same kind of uh, defining the next page, you will say, okay, my offset is now 10 and the size remains practically the same. Now, you tell me, does that URL offset equal to 10 represent the next set of items that the user is looking at? Uh, see, it kind of depends, like offset equal to 10, um, so offset equal to zero could mean, I don't know which place to start with. You give me the IDs offset equal to 10. Uh, yeah, it could be that. Okay. Count 10, but offset equal to, I would use a post ID that guys after this post, give me the next 10. That would Absolutely. be slightly better for me. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. The anchor for the pagination becomes critical here. In this case, if I am following a lot of, uh, users on Instagram, by the time I actually queried the next page, I would have maybe gotten the same set of items or even, uh, even newer items below, which the client, yes, the client can maybe compare the timestamps and do, but it can't actually react at that time while it is trying to show the next set of items. Uh, it can't maybe throw the user back into the top of the uh, feed. So uh, the anchor for generally reverse, reverse chronological uh, uh, set of items uh, can be the timestamp. Uh, but uh, all these things, I would say uh, it's good to control from control the anchor and mostly the URL, uh, other parameters in the URL and stuff from the backend. Right? Uh, because tomorrow, if you want to change this from reverse chronological to, uh, something else, you don't want to wait for an update, uh, that you have to send to your, uh, users and they have to also update, install the update, all that is unnecessary, right? So now we understood a few things. Basically we want the URL of the next page to come in its majority form, like from, uh, from the backend along with the items, right? Now we solve the next scrolling, right? Now we are technically dealing with an infinite scroll, right? So 
yes the client has some storage client has the ability to have a database uh, and store how many ever but i would say to just free yourself off from all the edge cases you should have at least in your in memory setup like if you are only keeping these items in memory and you don't have a database you should at least uh, try and avoid not to have more than 100 items representing your uh, ui state right because yeah 100 items. no um, so yeah, we will get to the image part and the UI part uh, slightly uh, later, but we are just now dealing with, okay, uh, there is some state uh, that we are storing uh, in our page uh, business logic entities, right? Okay. Okay, and so uh, uh, will be model also. Yeah. Some, some quick questions, sorry, I'm, I'm a little yeah. too like uh, on this. The, the idea is, uh, of uh, actually storing, let's say an ID, uh, a timestamp do you think it could be a problem if you're going to be uh, let's say having your own magic sauce magic solution which is going to say the ordering is based on not just timestamp but also on popularity um, uh, you know let's say the machine learning algorithm says that the recommendation should be ordered in this particular way would you uh, of instead of going for timestamp would you go for let's say post id and if it is post id then how the how the hell do you know that you know this post will not overtake the other one yeah, so uh, what our uh, recommendation engineers uh, kind of do is uh, they have the computation, the like basically they have which model they uh, queried this recommendation from some in a, in, in a small token and they also use the score. So most of the recommendation algorithms basically like why do you see this post higher because it is scored higher right so uh, most of them basically uh, give that score so uh, like they base they keep that uh, let's say your recommendation uh, pipelines are updating the model every few uh, hours or maybe once in a day or whatever right they are popular algorithms or those kind of things so you need uh, like that token that is pointing to okay you need to use this model only right because if you're scrolling again getting the same set of items you can't basically bank on your uh, your apps trying to deduplicate stuff uh, using their content IDs and stuff so it, in machine learning stuff it, it gets more because some machine learning collections also have have rules, right? Um, for example, I'll give you a first star example, right? We have the, we call it the masthead. Whatever, whenever, whenever you open the app, always you see the live cricket match. Uh, even though it's just started, we show it right away, right? So we have rules uh, that allow our content curators to dictate that, okay, this has to be shown for these cohort of users, no matter what the popularity of this content is, because it is just about to start. It is not going to uh, reflect in terms of popularity in the machine learning models yet. So we need that C, right? It kind of, uh, so it's a mix of both rule-based and machine learning model-based. So they compute all this information in terms of a small token and give put that token in the pagination uh, aspect. Page okay. Token. Okay. Yeah. That's that's kind of cool. You can do this on the server or the client, but I think yeah, doing it yeah. on the server is probably more sensible. Yeah, know, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's really really interesting to think of. Yeah, you're right. The machine learning is making the API a little more uh, complex. That's why I, <laughs> yeah. I initially chose to go back to the older the, model. The simple okay. one. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. For example. Makes sense. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, o overall, like at the very basic level, you have made it clear that, you know, we need to think about even in terms of pagination, what is the anchor that uh, should be there uh, on the server side? Also, we do consider the anchor. Uh, how do we, so this is, this is something which is, I think, uh, in collaboration with backend engineers, like the, the front end backend engineers work on this together. 
uh, you were mentioning i think something about caching yeah at this yeah. point like 100 tiles or what do you have to so use? majority of the time if you're doing something like an infinite scrolling feed you would want uh, to have a database in on your app so you don't want to always hit uh, the back end uh, to just scroll back to the same items that the user just saw okay okay right you just fetched a bunch of items when the user is scrolling back to top you, you should not you should avoid fetching the same data again and again so you we use this uh, device storage and we use it to even prefetch the stuff you open instagram right now on your phone you don't even see a loader sometimes right it's because uh, they try to set up some jobs a signal to the system saying that uh, in ios i guess it is more like asking the system before when you think the user would open my app run this particular thing for me right uh, in android there is something called a work manager it's almost like your jobs it's 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 job right so you can ask when the network is available and when the battery is so and so uh, uh, percentage uh, this job run it at this kind of frequency right uh, once in a day or twice a day and you get to run your job you get to prefetch some of the stuff i guess instagram uh, instagram like app would also choose to download the images also at that time right but we'll we'll get to that later we'll say user just open the app you are fetching the first set of items what we do is we fetch it we write to a db and we keep it in the db and we update the ui saying that was yes uh, these are the set of items that we have fetched okay now uh, when you're scrolling you scrolling okay yeah. okay you 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 use some sort of your own yes. like job schedulers plus yeah, you have yeah, your hmm, what sorry yeah you were saying um no uh, no no that makes sense uh, just a, a quick like uh, summary will be you use prefetching to basically avoid the latency for yeah. opening an app for a social media application it makes perfect sense what do you think right. about uh, uh, gmail gmail yeah again frequently used uh, user is going to uh, expect the data to be already there then you basically try and prefetch it keep it in your database user opens the app it's right there you might make a call again to see if there are even more fresher items and then you see that new posts till uh, instagram which you can tap and refresh the posts also but okay okay i i think you know what i'm noting all this stuff down because it's really useful firstly pagination uh, think about yep. the anchor think about the possibly ml models which are going to make this complex so that's that is super uh, helpful to think of uh, the second thing is that you have mentioned is to use the device storage uh, one interesting concept here is to prefetch data if you can and if it's worth it yeah okay yep. okay sure and the database is to aid us uh, in quickly fetching the data that the user is already screen has seen so in case of feeds user might be scrolling back and forth or uh, hey I, i saw something just now where where is it kind of behavior right like you don't know at the end of the day it's almost like an lru kind of stuff like your server is the last layer it's almost like the actual disk in in a way right uh, you have a cache uh, at on the device disk right like which is the one kind one layer of cache even uh, before that you have your in memory cache okay right okay. you guys also uh, have in memory cache okay yes. yes same applies for uh like typically typically for an application you would uh, use an image loading library which always which also has a similar set of l1 in memory cache l2 disk cache uh 
uh, kind of setup. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's the same on the server also, by the way. Yeah. We, we also have this, uh, you know, we have in-memory cache, then we have a global cache, then we we'll go like, okay, fine, then we'll go to the database. And if if nothing else, then we go like, okay, fine, let's go yeah, the other person. Too. Yeah, yeah, we can either compute or we can ask the other person, like you give me the data, like doing a network call, they ask their own database and then it's like, okay, fine, that's, uh, that's also interesting. What do you think about, uh, sorry for again, digging into this a little bit, but do you guys ever have this feeling that what if this data is stale? Yes, absolutely. Uh, for a feed, uh, what uh, you generally see, at least in Instagram, is they they automatically try and uh, see if there is newer posts when you try when you're near the top. I guess like the trigger for them is users scrolling to top. And they try and uh, check if there are newer posts because they, in the background, they're always hitting that first API, right? And if they get any newer data or any indication, I guess for an ML model, you will, uh, I'm not sure of what they kind of rely on, but uh, you can maybe have a time-based stuff, right? When, when was this data fixed, right? Uh, is it, if it is, few minutes older, then I will try and refetch this data. And if I'll see if there are any changes, right? Are there any newer updates to this? Uh, and notify the user that, okay, boss, there are newer posts, we, we want to see it. Twitter, I guess, just adds it up to the top of the list and you just scroll, keep scrolling. I guess mostly Twitter, you scroll upwards more than downwards. Uh, 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 on all of this. which means Twitter is not fetching the top 10. It's always fetching from the anchor to top, right? It's going in the reverse direction also. So I, I'll be interested to see uh, how Twitter's page and APIs are because it works both ways, which is crazy. And they have markers for, uh, it's like, okay, this is this was too old. I'm not going to show you the actual tweets unless you click a show me more tweets here. But, but at the end of the day, when you're uh, having an infinite scroll like system, you would want to store all the posts in your database. You should be able to look them up and get them in the order that the backend gave us. If it is a rev reverse chronological feed, it becomes easy. We just have a timestamp a column in our uh, Escalate database and we just order by that uh, in our query and we can connect our UI directly to the uh, database and we can have listeners. Okay, whenever the database updates automatically give me updates and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, all, all, I think there might be a offset on multiple things also. Like one of the things is, okay, you have uh, offset on timestamp uh, and then you have offset on, let's say the, uh, the recommendation score, like you said. So, you know, if you, if you say, okay, give me all the posts having timestamp greater than X, that might be hitting a separate kind of query. And this one might be hitting a separate kind of query. Okay. Give me the normal feed and in the same order. Interesting. So the client doesn't actually have a single property of the data to hook on to for the order. We generally uh, try and use something like an ordinal. Like we just say, we I'll just use a number to uh, order these things. Excuse me. And I use the order in which that I get the response from, from the server to decide the ordinal. Right? I got the first top, top recommended stuff. I, the, the top one gets score uh, like ordinal one, the next one gets two, and then I can just uh, uh, write my query using ordinal in ascending order. Then if I get newer ones, we can go minus one, all that stuff. But generally, if you see the Instagram UI now, after it switched to a uh, machine learning model, right? When you, uh, they show you just new posts still, they automatically, automatically don't add stuff on top of the feed so that we just scroll up. They just show you new posts. So when you click that, they basically swap everything that you are seeing with the new data. 
right so it's like a it's like a switch like you can basically have uh the entire old data removed and then you can just rely on the new set of data news i mean you can restart your ordinal counts or all that stuff so yes that's cleaner in a way yes and because the client now has very it's really tough for the client devices to hook on to a particular um thing for order they just i guess use the order in which they get it and that is what needs to be stored in the database also so that all these pages kind of are stitched when you query them right yeah and we can we might look at okay this is in the database we are just storing them as a list of items how are they represented in your page state i think that will be an important aspect to discuss i guess we are trying to uh, enter into the architect uh, <laughs> side of things yeah. side of things now uh, so repository okay yeah we just say this is in charge this is a entity that is going to just make it down for us to just fetch the data right it will give you uh functions it will expose functions uh to just get the data listen to changes and all that stuff it 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 abstracts away that there is a network api there uh, there is a database there and you just worry you just write a feed repository and everything in the ui just ask it stuff and they get stuff is it and, is it like it has its own tiny cache it has its own tiny database also it has its own like network um uh, what do they say like if if you ask it then it first figures out do i have it in the cache no do i have it in the database no okay let me go and talk to the yes the server yeah yeah okay yes, the whole thing. so but we we generally try and keep this a stateless thing so if you ask for stuff it will do all of these computations and give you back the final thing right 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 through cache all that stuff it this will ensure and this is generally like a single ton thing that is shared so if someone let's say user clicks on a post go to the details of it they can again the other page also gets the same instance to try and hook on to the same feed table or feed cache or whatever if uh, posts, yeah posts repository for let's say you are going from your feed to you are looking at your friend's profile and but you are just looking at posts there uh in some cases you would want to share the same entities across all these pages uh as a singletons so so that like there is not multiple cache uh items or repositories are uh, created for each of the page wow okay yeah what you are doing is you are sharing the cache you are you are saying that some process goes finds out that i am a let's say gorav is searching for um uh, cycles yeah. and now you go like okay the uh, let me save the information for gloves because he's probably going to purchase gloves so uh, the when he comes back and he actually goes and sees the gloves he sees that that image is already loaded uh, is this i mean i i'm taking analogy here uh, of course it may not be the exact thing but do do services work as a team uh, that if this happens then you should probably go and save that in the cache for someone else or is that too deep coupling like no you generally want to avoid it unless you actually see the bottleneck in the user experience right got it. Uh, got it. generally these kind of prefetches uh hooks to uh preload any data all these things should generally come from uh our metrics or our real life experience of using the app saying that okay this is too much we can probably improve this right the time it takes for us to load the recommended content let's say your on amazon you watched a product you are recommending content so is looking at it right you might want to take a guess and preload that content but then the other side of preloading uh, contents is the load on your server right the user might not be actually interested in this right and most ctrs are actually very low that the 
ratio for preloading versus reducing load actually uh, shifts to reducing load right because we can't predict with such, such certainty that the user will uh, definitely tap on this maybe i would say for hotstar there is a maybe like one or two cases where we might choose to do it maybe the master that i was talking about it uh, if the score is so high uh, our backend can basically maybe give us a parameter that okay preload this thing right? yeah i i think um, you you hit the nail on the head you just said that premature optimization is not necessary uh, it, yeah. it's bringing in a lot of coupling a lot of dependency uh, yeah. and yeah, a lot of it's load on the server and a lot of cases. a lot of load on the server I, i think there's also the side effect like okay i loaded uh, bike images what what the hell what the hell just happened why is my phone so slow suddenly so yeah. that's that's the side effect right uh, it's it's for your own good but <laughs> no no whether it's for your good or not yeah makes sense yeah that's fine yeah so this is basically going to provide me data i'm just going to abstract everything else because we discussed uh, uh, slightly uh, about there being a database and uh, the api structures etc now uh, there will be something like there is not a i i'll say this is a view model i'll maybe let me call it page controller okay right or feed controller because we are talking about feed right this is also feed repository this looks like a mbc architecture to me now. uh yeah i mean you call it view model you get uh, uh yeah yeah you you uh, talked about MBA controller and repository MBA. yeah yeah how do i do this yeah let me actually just name it view model because that's what most people do these days oh even on the on the mobile side yes uh because uh a lot of our ui frameworks are also moving to a place where okay they just want to represent the ui as a function of a data like that data comes from the view model which is the state and ui is just a function of state state changes your ui changes right react jetpack compose swift ui flutter all of these frameworks in the recent uh, like few years have been converging into this model of representing complex uis in this way like you take your state and you just write a function to represent your ui you add if conditions and all that stuff if the state is this do this if the state says that there are new posts then show this new post spill if the state says that it is loading the next page then show a loader at the bottom if the state says that it is loading the feed again because user swiped to refresh then show the refresh thing if the state there says that there are 100 items then size the scroll bar for 100 items right everything is uh, basically a function of what the state is and feed view model takes care of the state and it gets its input is from the ui right uh i'll maybe color this as a yellow one feed view model is the function it's it's more than a function i would say the, the ui has the function right and uh, it talks to okay let me how do i put a directed arrows you just need to go to the yes. over here and pull it here yeah okay. and this is the way i would represent right right the can i add text here state comes from the view model okay yeah how do you how do you do that oh you text. just double click on the arrow yeah ha oh, man okay <laughs> state and uh, let's say events uh 
oh now i get it react yeah i understood in 3 seconds or <laughs> <laughs> so user tap this user swipe to refresh user is about to hit the end of the scroll all these are events for preview mode in fact events come even from the other side right uh now it's trying to fetch data from feed repository uh but it actually is a asynchronous a asynchronous call right and in fact we actually switch our threads mostly to background whenever we are doing any kind of io wow. right okay you have right. that on mobile also multi threaded applications we have to otherwise uh, the ui will be blocked and that's where you will see jank and uh, unless basically hitting the desk is slightly heavy uh, doing any kind of heavy computation let's say your blurring a uh, uh, image yeah like over here right yeah 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 you would want to maybe i don't know how uh, it happens uh, on webgl based uh, blur, uh, blurring like real time blurring but uh, at the end of the day like whenever you are doing any kind of heavy computation that can block a thread you basically do it off of the main thread you are sending analytics why do you do want to do it in the main thread just create an immutable object of what you want to track fire it in some background thread right etc so the, the same concept like message queue put it on a background thread fire over there low priority okay do you do you guys have priorities also for threads or is it like uh yes uh, in in ios especially they divide so you can't in android i guess they gave main threads io threads computation threads and i forgot the fourth one but in in ios also they have priority based background threads also oh, so your pools like yeah pools yes so io pool gets a certain number of threads and all that so interesting yeah this is similar very similar and very interesting okay now in the feed view model you are representing the state of the ui you are saying okay x number of items next page is loading when the next page request comes you have to maybe unset the i mean that if you are representing it as a boolean you will unset that boolean and uh, we generally do state copy as i said we try to use immutable objects as much as possible so whenever the state changes we try to create a new copy of the state and give it to the feed view right uh now feed view model this is where the uh, like to kind of uh, uh, represent how complex this thing can this thing can get right like right now let's understand how many people are trying to tell feed view model something happened from various various threads right user can scroll to top or scroll to end at any point like he wants he can swipe to refresh any point it he wants we are we asked the feed repository for the next page feed repository can take its own sweet time and it will uh, generally if you asked it in the io thread will probably respond it in io thread you can control where it kind of gives you the call back and all that stuff but at the end of the day feed repository can come at any time feed repository can come back with the next page response after user has swiped to refresh right then what will you make the state as you can't say next page has loaded and update the list with new items right and all uh, it gets complex like this so what you try to uh, reduce the number of asynchronous stuff that can come back to you when you, when things like swipe to refresh happens when you see swipe to refresh you basically cut off all the calls that are pending right now like page all that stuff and then start a new call to fetch the new data you get that one you show the new data you don't 
you may be show an error saying that unable to reach instagram right so okay this is uh, just that's very interesting manik uh, do you do you guys cancel network calls absolutely we have to. okay okay uh, and then then you also have like okay like you said i was going down going down going down then i said oh no, 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 let me go back up i yes. swipe to refresh also yes. so what if that call just gave a response you discard the response you say yeah, this is not no more use to me uh, what's it like so uh, we we don't handle it at like uh, network call level we we try and handle it uh, in our abstractions for asynchronous processing for example we have something called core routines in android for kotlin right if, if you can start a core routine only with something called a scope right in this case i would maybe end my current scope i would say cancel on that scope so none of the callbacks or the coroutines that were running on this i mean they get to maybe finish what they're doing but they when they like are trying to get back to the caller or something coroutine scope basically ends stuff there basically right uh, so you might want to use your abstractions to figure uh, these things out for you in rx uh, kind of uh, patterns also they have something called disposables uh, where you can dispose of a particular asynchronous uh, observable subscription that you have created something uh, yeah you would want to you handle it at that level and that network call if it is just about to be finished and it is finished sure do your stuff right uh, otherwise you don't like so feed repository if it if it wants to not do anything if a uh, feed view model scope is done it will just work within the scope that the feed view model gave it or feed feed repository can say okay do ui user will do whatever he wants but if my network call just finished i'll make sure i write the data to the cache in case i will need it okay okay so right. th this is like really scope is a really important concept from what i understand yes yes yes, yes. very very important yeah. uh, like, like with us what happens is uh, like on on the back end side you have a thread you go uh, response is no longer useful uh, you can fail the thread you can time out the thread you can say that okay fine gone uh, and then you're having things running concurrently but yeah uh, scope is it something like time out that can it be can it have a time out like this you're going to change the scope based on time or no. you're going to change the scope based on events e events majority of the time right let's the page itself is going away right in this case the feed is the first page so probably it will never go away from the stack let's say you we are you just clicked on a post and is reading the comments right and he just went back the page is no longer there you don't want to uh you want to clear your resources that you acquired to basically uh clear the page completely from the stack right why while, while you might want to keep the cache that you have written while you were in this page right maybe user want to click again maybe the back was an accident in that right so your caches your even your in memory caches like an application level in memory caches and all that stuff should work mostly if, if within an lru kind of a mindset user like if user has used very recently there is a very high chance that the user is going to use it again right unless there is an explicit swipe to refresh kind of a call where you say okay this is clear indication that the user is done with whatever is doing uh, right until now so then you can maybe use uh, it to clear uh, some of your resources like that but the page page scope and clearing so uh, uh, your state and your processes your listeners uh, all those things uh, will really be important otherwise you you leak your memory let's say you started a network call or you're listening to some entity trying to get back to you if you don't clear it and your page is gone 
suddenly this all these entities are in, uh, hanging in the memory and the gc can't clear it because this uh, this is set as a listener and nobody is there to answer it anymore correct yeah yeah that's what i was thinking about garbage collection you know yep so the scope becomes important in that aspect as well the page what, what, uh, yeah. uh, do you have any idea in terms of the scope like the gc when it comes is it a custom garbage collector that goes and sees that you know or or the scope is the only thing which is pointing to all of these guys uh i use scope in a slightly more loose sense here uh like it, it the scope is what we control for ourselves uh, as i said uh the scope i was referring to when we and i said cancel the network requests and stuff i was re- referring to the core routine scope uh, or your rx disposables and those kind of things they which allow you to cancel right you cancel all of the things that they are, that were started in there uh and there is a uh, like this feed view model it needs to not exist and be ready for garbage collection when your feed ui is gone the stack right so mostly like uh, these things are provided to us uh by let's say google's jetpack libraries right they make sure that the view models are cleared there is a clear method by the way on the view model that uh uh jetpack provides us the similar constructs on ios also they have something called view controllers for every page uh and that's that's the ui aspect most people write logic also there uh, who are fine with mvc but who, are, who want to do mvvm they make a separate entity called uh, view model but that needs to get cleared when the page is going away that is the important aspect in keeping your memory clean in a way so that you don't keep filling it up and then you're out of memory right right you you you're, you're avoiding memory leaks resource leaks basically yeah. uh, by doing this you're also it's not just that you're avoiding leaks you're actually freeing up those resources so that for the thing that you need right now immediately yeah. you you can actually allocate those resources uh, okay that's great uh, manideep what is mvvm model view model sorry model view view model yeah model view view model yeah. <laughs> okay this is something that i think uh, it's been a while i actually said the whole thing is uh, mvvm is so common <laughs> i never had to spell it out fully <laughs> okay no uh, this is different uh, we yeah this is would you suggest like a person who's coming in as a as a fresh mobile engineer do you think they should know this as a as a basic thing or are there complex things here that they should you know first um finish point number 1 2 and 3 and then you should go for 4 5 6 or is, is it like no you should know these six things to just go ahead um and, and maybe talk to your seniors maybe try doing these in a in a small mini project yeah most of the starter courses that you can take uh teach you at least the view model the scope aspects cleaning your stuff up uh those aspects uh, they definitely teach right uh i i wouldn't go maybe like repository is subjective like you want that you don't want that it depends upon the complexity of the resource that you are trying to fetch if it always you're just going to hit the api you might as well just call it feed api right uh and nothing else in there so mm, again don't try to pre optimize uh as a senior engineer you can have that sense okay i'll definitely need this but as a junior engineer i would say be reactive in terms of performance optimizations uh yeah okay i'll i'll note that down then uh don't pre optimize Uh, this is something so when you say junior engineers you know be a little careful before you are pre optimizing is it a is it a pattern that you see because i do yes. see it on the yeah on the back end side also people go like hey on right there <laughs> that's, that's uh, <laughs> yes, yes absolutely like they see a list uh, that they are trying to access uh, an item of it using like let's say the id 
immediately make a map. Like, it's fine. To the list dot filter with the ID. It's, it's gonna take lesser time. It's fine. Like uh, unless you see it actually impacting dropping a frame, and then you figure out okay, in when you're doing some kind of profiling, you see a big red bar. Okay, this function actually is taking time. Then you can get in and say okay. Majority of the time, for a client engineer, the performance optimization opportunities uh, or performance problem reasons will be like, okay, you are making three API calls in sequence before actually showing anything on the screen here, right? You might want to combine all of these into one API, or maybe show the data partially and incrementally, right? Or you just fetch this data just before, maybe you might want to cache it, keep it in the disk or keep it in memory. Never, it will never be you're accessing this list, which is, we never deal with lists which are of sizes of, never, it never happens. The heaviest objects in client side mostly are the images and the videos. Right, uh, uh, but then most of the time when we are dealing with them, we already use a library who took care of all the best practices. So we don't have, to, right? But if you're just dealing with a list of posts, you don't need a map. Yeah, but I I think let's uh, it, it's a it's an important thing. Don't pre-optimize, especially for the younger engineers. This by the way is true also for the backend. They come it's, in and they go like, oh my God, <laughs> look at that. Even now, while I'm saying this, it's just so ingrained in our habits to not repeat ourselves, to uh, to like just extract that common function, write that interface way before you understand what the abstraction is, uh, all that stuff. But yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, over engineering and uh, pre-optimization is I think in our blood, uh, yes. uh, it feels good. Uh, but yeah, if, if you really want to avoid this, I think the easiest way to do is to actually look at metrics, even on the server side, if you see like there's a spike and it's really becoming a problem then and only then go there. And that too, my, in my personal experience, 90% uh, memory leak, 90% cache being used badly. That's it. <laughs> that, that is it. Same here. Same here. As a mobile engineer, you need to be, uh, very about three things. Uh, is, it, is the code right, right? To be able to understand whether you are writing the right code or not, you need to understand when the code will run, right? You're writing a line. A lot of the times it's inside a callback or inside a, some listener. You need to be crystal clear of, okay, I'm this line, this line is just one above the other, but maybe this will execute before this because it's a callback inside a callback and all those things. Yeah, yeah, concurrency. That happens in server side also. Yes, yes absolutely. And you need to understand which thread uh, these things will happen. That is kind of like when aspect only. And the other thing is, what is the scope of the entity that I'm dealing with? When it when does it get created? When is it, when do we need to end it or when does it get destroyed? Right? If you're dealing with a page, it'll be as long as the page is there. If you're dealing with uh, in memory cache application level, you are dealing with okay application level uh, stuff until the application is dead. You don't have to. In iOS, it is more, I guess, even more uh, involved because they suppress uh, most of the code execution of an app once it goes to background. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, I'm getting you. I'm getting you. Like over there, it's even harder. This is the strange thing about, um, about, I think about, you know, mobile engineering or, or even things in the UI. We, uh, on, on the backend, there's a lot of things like, Hey, the server can die anytime or the server can die, but actually no, not really like, <laughs> okay. It can die. Yes, but it will die. So it will just be dead. You can restart it, uh, on the mobile engineering side. I think it's much more, uh, more like, yeah, it can happen. It can, it can, they, they can leave the app. Uh, so. Yeah. It's much more common in that sense. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, so 
we have something like continue watching, right? Uh, we try to understand uh, where you left a particular episode so that we can come back and resume at the exact same time. Exactly, that timestamp, yeah. So on mobile, we made the feature for mobile. Uh, people are using it. We try to store the timestamp when you are exiting the video or the exiting the app, right? Makes perfect, perfect sense. Working well, metrics are good, experiencing it. Now we are into living room, TVs. Strategy worked on mobile. Let's put the same strategy on TV, right? People switch off their TVs, right? It's yeah, perfectly accepted user behavior. <laughs> yeah, they don't switch off their cell phone. Yeah. I mean, it actually is also happening when your phone also dies, but we were, it's happening so rarely and most people don't report those kind of things. So we weren't, we didn't, it was an edge case on mobile also, but it's happening so uh, infrequently. So you really need to uh, get to the fact that you are less in control of when your particular pieces of code will run. You just have to cater to all kinds of scenarios and work with the correctness in all that crazy, uh, I, I would say. Yeah, the environment uh, is not in your hand at all. Like, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, the permutation of combinations is explored because the number of vectors uh, you're dealing with uh, are very uh, like high. I would say on a mobile device or on the client side these days, especially when you're dealing with multi-threaded uh, processes and like you're making multiple API calls. It's very frequent uh, these days with the GraphQL APIs for that most people. Uh, it's take Instagram only, right? You open the uh, Instagram app, they're probably fetching the feed, fetching the stories, Prefetch, uh, downloading some of the uh, images and videos or something. They're, they're trying to get how many hundred messages you have to show that bubble on the top. They're trying to fetch if you have any notifications. All this, yeah, probably not in a single API call, right? I wouldn't do it in a single API call as well. Uh, I wouldn't mind. But it's yeah, because like, any one of them can fail. Like, they yeah. don't get half big can fail and you would want to prioritize for the main content in general and the parallel parallel API calls are cheaper like because of HTTP2 and uh, like higher bandwidth uh, these days at least in India thanks to Theo <laughs> you can make uh, parallel API calls on mobile no worries but if you're making them in sequence that's that's where the problem comes right okay if you say okay your Product manager just said, boss, I, we are in a very experimental state. We should be able to change our main menu uh, on the fly. So you decide to, okay, fetch the menu, right? And then only I can know which is the first page and then fetch the first page, right? So you should probably make it so that, okay, menu, there is a cached entity. There is also a default entity, but I can maybe update it in the background these kind of things. So avoid sequential API calls, but you can, you can go to town with parallel API calls. I think it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Super interesting. Uh, thank you Manidhi, for actually making, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the engineers here are backend engineers. Some of them are frontend engineers. So the, so the mobile and the frontend engineers will already know about this, but from the backend engineering side, there are many things which are similar. And many things which are totally different. Uh, like you said, the TV bug, you must have uh, changed the code and then deployed it. And deploy is not just, okay, deploy it, server deployed, okay, fine, I'm going home, bro. <laughs> it's more like, how many of these guys actually uh, downloaded the, the latest version? Yep. How many of them are remaining? So it's a big uh, factor. That's why uh, if you uh, have read Jeet's uh, post recently, he kind of uh, tried to articulate what are the necessary uh, like table stake stuff if you are releasing an app these days. He added that you need to have a flow to force upgrade it to your users. 
because you can't like if you have a fatal bug that's the only way like user opens the app you need to block them ask them to upgrade right uh the second one is you need to have some kind of remote configuration maybe it's not a fatal bug but you want to maybe tune some of your parameters turn off some features because you don't uh, see the value in it or th that particular flow has a bug in it all that stuff so these things are critical uh, if you take uh, for example uh, hotstar we we roll out an app how how many days do you think it will take for all of our user base to get that person <laughs> well hmm how often do you have game of thrones <laughs> <laughs> i don't think game of thrones uh, would play a part ipl maybe but i would say unless we force all of our users to upgrade they'll at least be there will at least be 10 to 20% of users who are just on the version that they download because play store's default setting is to only auto update on wifi right they didn't expect i mean this setting was made way before jio existed and uh, if you go to a small town even when i uh, go to my native place today i actually use my hotspot to even work right i did nobody even things right now to get a wifi there right so use your mobile hotspot or maybe get that uh, mobile or dongle stuff so maybe these things will change uh, but at the end of the day uh, you can't control your or you force your user to download in a way uh, i mean unless you have force forcing, forcing that yeah 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 uh, yeah this this problem does not i mean it's a, it's a very rare uh, thing on the server like okay you have a breaking change uh, but i mean everything is in your hand right you can yeah. you can just go and say okay change it that's why i, I think, think I more think and more people are choosing to put a lot of their logic on the back end right the kind of request i told you product managers do we need to be able to change our menu so put it on the server and get it to the server it stems from the fact that them not being able to push updates on the phone they are native yeah, helps yes, yes of course it yeah, helps uh it's uh, awesome it's one of the its biggest strengths i would say uh but i think the platform is still maturing and uh it will take a while for it to be the key for the cost mari i have no idea what you meant by react native helps but <laughs> let's let's take oh. that for uh, uh, for like uh, either a little bit of homework and uh, the next time that you are on we we can uh, talk a little more about that because i have absolutely no idea about front end technologies this is something like i feel like you know uh, when someone is cracking inside joke or uh, or there is there is a community which understands and then they make fun of it like for example today at interview ready we had a production issue and uh, one of one of the people in the in the pm team uh, uh, they they were saying that i asked them that can you go and prod and just check if things are working and they are like i don't have access for prod <laughs> i'm like okay <laughs> staging ka access nahi hai i can understand prod ka access bhi nahi hai okay <laughs> no, there is a problem if users need access to access prod <laughs> that's that that's how it is so i feel like i am in the same stage where you like react native is awesome you know <laughs> i, I uh, but this is great manidip thank you so much for coming uh, just to reiterate the points that you have picked up when it comes to let's say mobile engineering some of the things to keep in mind especially if you take an example of infinite scrolling is how are you going to be designing the apis if you are thinking about pagination think about the the anchor that you have or how you're going to get the next 10 elements so on uh, ml complicates things in general that's what we saw uh, but of course it is a necessity also in most apps uh, device storage we talked about prefetching data if possible you talked about having a cache having a device storage very similar to how you have it in any computer you have uh, you know main memory before that you have a cache and then later on you have secondary storage so that's also there on the on the mobile side which is interesting because after all this you know is skipped then you come to the back end actually and actually the api 
then you you talked about uh, interesting architecture MVVM. Uh, I mean, basically, if if we don't think of the acronyms also, the repository is the place which manages data. You don't need to think about how it's getting the data. You yeah, basically it's, care it's about this. small abstraction to remove the complexity that there is a in-memory cache, there is a database. There is, yeah, basically it simplifies things for the view model because view model is already probably complex, complex enough. So that's another interesting thing. You, you mentioned that as an abstraction, the view model, uh, and you also mentioned scope uh, as an abstraction. Uh, and an abstraction which tells you that what are the things which need to be either removed uh, when when the user makes a change. Uh, uh, interesting that you mentioned that events actually trigger this. Yeah. When, when the user does something, that time there's an event which goes to the view model, and the view model behaves like a. It gives you the new state. The yep. UI is a function of the state. Whenever UI needs any update. Uh, that's the only way view model uh, talks to the view. Just Got it. Change the Events come back with the new state. Okay, I'll I'll change the front end. I'll, I'll change the UI. Oh, another thing happened. Please change the state. I got the state. Okay, so this is a cycle, and the view model is is using this abstraction of repository. Okay, okay, uh, and then some of the like. The things which are general in engineering don't pre-optimize and uh, you know plan your deployments. Something which is very specific to mobile engineering is when you're planning your deployments, make sure that you have. I think these are like fallbacks or fail safes, like yeah, feature flags and con remote configuration. Uh, have the ability to change a few critical things on the flight from the server side. Awesome, awesome. Those are like you know the last, the last thing which is saving you. If, if nothing, then than this. Uh, I mean, it, it's not necessarily fatal stuff. Let's say uh, you have your analytics system that is kind of batching every 20 events and sending. You you uh, recognize that, okay, you actually recently reduced the size of your analytics events. You can maybe increase that batch length to 40 or reduce it to 10 because our events got bigger recently. Right, because you don't want to deal with such a big payload at your ingestion level. Or something. Any small configurable parameters that you might want to change on the flight, it is good to have something like a Firebase Remote Config. I guess Superbase also has an alternative to the same. Uh, some kind of remote configuration mechanism. Right, the, the config seems like a soft way to update things and make people not even realize that they are actually updated. You're, yeah, you're doing something which is like just tweaking few dials, and those dials are basically on the server side. Yes, yes, yes. So it's like it's like a it's not even a software update. You you don't need any software update. You're just changing the dials on the server and telling the front end that now you'll behave this way. Uh, yes. On yes. the other hand, that force the the forced uh, force update. Up. Yeah, that's that's much more like direct on your face, like. Maybe you haven't updated for six months now. Now we are going to do this, or you have a fatal change. Uh, go ahead. Yes, you know, force update. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, thank you, Manidhi, for actually like enlightening us on on this particular topic. Uh, I don't think there's been a lot of content around this on YouTube or anywhere. But uh, guys, if you want to want to harass Manidhi, you should head to Twitter with OK Manidhi. Uh, it's, you know, he, he posts about mobile engineering and, and he's a experienced engineer at Hotstar. So if you have any, like, let's say I want to design a cache on the, on the mobile side, harass him enough, he'll be back with us. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we can, we can take that up. So thank you so much, Manidhi. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, until next time then see you. Yeah. Hope, uh, folks got to what they were expecting out of this. Uh, mostly I, I tried to stay way, uh, high level on the high level because uh, I expect the audience to be more on the back end side of things. Just enlightening them about some key concepts so that they can empathize with their uh, UI engineer better when they say, okay, we need to change the pagination parameters differently. No, absolutely. And uh, also one very important point here is that the agenda of today's talk is 
at the end of it, we want people who are on the backend engineering side to understand how mobile engineering works. If you want to move to mobile engineering, this is a good place to start. Uh, also, if you're a fresh engineer and you're heading to mobile engineering, this is a great place to start. So it's the basics. Um, and uh, that, that's the reason why MariDP is keeping it at a high level. Of course, if you want to get into details, maybe we can share some blogs. Uh, post your doubts in the comments, post your you know, suggestions in the comments. We can have a great discussion. MariDP will probably be joining us. So yeah. it'll be amazing. Yeah. Looking forward to the, to the questions. I think uh, we'll have quite a few of them because we covered a lot of things in the high level. I think I'm expecting a lot of curiosity from you. Uh, awesome, guys. Yeah. Please post your questions. Manideep, until next time then, see you, take care.